Thank you. It's a, a great honor to be here, not only in Vancouver, but at the Urban Forum for many reasons. About 35 years ago, uh, about 35 years ago, I, it was the first time I came to Vancouver when the Human Settlements Conference was done in 1976. And actually, our father was in charge of leading that conference as Under Secretary General of the UN. So I was in first year of university, and maybe Vancouver has a magical bug that it, it bites you. Because then, following that, years later, one of my brothers, the two of us were here. He became mayor of Bogota, I was commissioner of Bogota, and we're doing a lot of work around. And actually, a few years ago, when you had the World Urban Forum in Vancouver, he spoke. So Vancouver is magical in many, many ways. So today we're going to be talking about cities for people. Because densities is about that, about cities for people. And I'm going to tell a little bit about some of the places where I have been recently and some of the work that we have been doing. For example, three weeks ago, I was in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we were working with the mayor and the minister of transportation because the population of Johannesburg is going to double in the next 30 years. So the issue of density is absolutely critical and the issue, the issue of mobility and transportation and how to densify and how to get people to places because it's not only they're building BRTs all over the place, but public transit is never going to pick us up in front of our houses and drop us off in our, in our destination. So if the city is not walkable or bikeable, so that is a big issue. But then I had two or three days in between. I was going to go to Brisbane two weeks ago, so I stopped at a wonderful, beautiful, National Park and then it was Kruger National Park and one of the things that I loved about this park is I started looking at all of these animals wonderful they were like magical this park is bigger than the size of Israel so it's a really big big park but after looking at all of the parks for two or three days and listening to everybody who works there and who has been studying so much one of the things that came to my mind is that we really know so much about what makes animals happy. <laughs> and we know so little about what makes people happy. Otherwise, we would be making cities differently. We would really be making cities for people. And cities for people sounds very simple. You know, but you know, when we start thinking about it, there are very few places in our city, even complete neighborhoods. No, just even a street where we can allow 8-year-olds and 80-year-olds to just wander around in a safe manner. So cities for people is not just a simplistic. It's about how do we want to live? And when we are recreating cities for people, part of it is we have some ingredients. You know, it's in the same way if we're going to make a delicious pasta, we got to get some ingredients. And then we make the delicious pasta. Because if we don't get nice ingredients, then we end up with a spiceless pasta. And then people don't like spiceless pastas. <laughs> but also people don't like spiceless cities. And people move out of the spiceless cities. And people move in to the cities with spices. What are the ingredients for a city for people? First is pedestrians. Human beings, we are pedestrians. You know, we got two eyes and two ears. We all walk at around five kilometers an hour. And when we walk, we use all our senses. We see the children playing and we hear the birds singing. And we go in front of a coffee shop and we smell the, the aroma. So, you know, pedestrian is very, very important. By the way, every single trip begins and ends by walking. We walk to places, we walk to transit, we walk to the bikes, we walk everywhere. So pedestrians have to be our priority, our top priority. So when we're also densifying, it's about pedestrian and pedestrian going to be a top priority. And next to pedestrians is the cyclist. Actually, I think that cycling is just a more efficient way of walking. If we're going to go one kilometer, we walk. But if we're going to go five kilometers, we bike. But if we're going to go 20, we take public transit. And then the, public, the three of them are totally in sync. And actually, the public space is the glue that links all of this together. And when we get all of them together, then we got sustainable mobility, and we got cities for people. And that is a key element to densify. And people will say, what is 8280 cities? Well, 8280 cities, basically, we're not about walking or cycling or parks or streets. Those are means. Our goal is, how can we contribute to create vibrant cities with healthy communities where people are going to be happier enjoying public places. So that's the idea. We're going to start thinking, what if 
everything that did we, that we did in our streets and other public places, the indicator is that it had to be fantastic for eight-year-olds and for 80-year-olds. We would end up with good communities for everybody. You know, we got to stop building cities as if everybody was 30-year-old and athletic. We got to build cities for all. So that's what 8280 cities is about. And you know, we seem to be facing a perfect storm. We got traffic congestion, and we got climate change, and we got obesity crisis, and we got economic crisis, and all of them seem at the same time we feel a little bit overwhelmed. So, and we got two additional realities in Canada that are challenges, but can also be opportunities. The, there's a population is growing, and also we're living longer. And from the point of view of population, you know, in the world, the in the next 30 years, the world is going to have 2 billion additional people, most of it in the developing world. But also, not only around the world, in the U.S., in the next 30 years, it's going to increase by 100 million. In Canada, in the next 30 years, we're going to grow the equivalent of the five largest cities in just 25 or 30 years. So this means that not only do we have to improve the communities that we have today, but we've got to create great cities for millions and millions of additional people. So again, it's a wonderful opportunity, but that's not exactly what we've been doing, taking advantage of that opportunity. And whatever we do or don't do is going to be there for hundreds of years. So obviously, we need to densify, but one size doesn't fit all. There are many ways. Roger Evans provides these 10 different examples on how to densify different areas. So it's time for change in so many ways. And how to move from talking to doing. In my previous life, I was commissioner of Parks and Recreation in Bogota. And we did some things. For example, we built five metropolitan parks, 50 some parks, and we did over 250 neighborhood parks when I was commissioner. This was one of them. The Pope came here, gave a mass for a million people, and in 27 years, nothing happened. The city just put a wire fence around. No one could go in, and they planted a few trees, but there was not a bench, not a sidewalk, nothing. And in 36 months, we turned it into this and built sidewalks and bikeways, and we did all kinds of other things, because also part of densifying is people sometimes, they go out to the suburbs because they think they're going to have a green space. Now, in the cities, we can have even nicer green spaces with more people. And it's not only, by the way, the, the way we measure these parks is not how many architectural awards they have won, but actually how many people are using them. That, has, that, that is the key indicator of, of these parts. Obviously, we can have both, get the, uh, the architectural awards and also get people. That is fantastic. But not only about parks. For example, we built in, in just three years 280 kilometers of physically separated bikeways. And we went from 28,000 to over 350,000 people cycling. And some of them, these are some of them in, in between of the, the buildings, and some of them were next to the roads, and also linking with public transit. And actually, some of these were in places that here in Vancouver, even in your worst nightmare, you wouldn't even see, dream of these places. You know, so poor, but the way the quality of life changes. You know, the reality is that when people live like this and all of a sudden you create, you know, pedestrian and, 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 and cycling areas that are as good as the best ones in Copenhagen or New York and so on. And part of this is we have to be consistent and we got to ask our politicians to be consistent between what they think, what they say and what they do. So we say that pedestrians are first, and then cyclists, and then cars. That's what we got to do. We didn't have money for walking and cycling and cars. So we chose the first two. Eventually, another administration will pave the road for the cars. <laughs> yeah. And then we did the Ciclovia, which is a magnificent thing. There was a very small project when we came on board. And then in just three years, we went from uh, about 10 kilometers to over 121 kilometers. What is it? On Sundays, we open the streets to the people and close them to cars. Actually, this Sunday in San Francisco, we were celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Sunday streets in San Francisco. Now it's in San Francisco, in New York. It's in over 70 cities, small and big and rich and poor, because this is great. You know, this is showing the people that the streets can have different uses according to the day the day of the week, the time of the day, and so on. And along the route, people do other activities, such as aerobics. And this is something that is, and in a time of economic recession, is great. 
Because all of the sudden, you don't have to invest money in, capital, in gymnasiums and arenas. You just open the streets to the people and close them to cars. And we get, we're getting in Bogota now, young and old and rich and poor, every, over a million people every Sunday of the year. That's something that is quite interesting. Well, currently, I'm executive director of the NGO 8280 Cities, based in Toronto. And when I go, one of the nice things is that I get to meet people like you and get to learn from all of you and from cities. For example, Copenhagen. I go quite often to Copenhagen because I'm a senior consultant with the firm Gale Architects. And actually, last week, at the beginning of last week, I was there and we were having lunch, 23 people in the space of one car. Another way of using car parking. But you know, change is hard everywhere. Not only in Vancouver, everywhere. You know, when in Copenhagen they were going to create their first pedestrian street, they said, what? Pedestrian street? You know, here we got too many cars. And the weather is horrible. It's cold in the winter. It's hot in the summer. It rains all year. But the number one issue that why they didn't want pedestrian streets is because they had pedestrian people walking. You know, that's, the, that's not part of our culture. That's for the Italians. Because the Italians are loud and noisy, but we are Danish and cold and quiet. Well, now the Danish are more Italian than the Italians. <laughs> they love their pedestrian streets and they love the, this, their densities. And look at this is City Hall in Copenhagen. And they went from car invasion to people places. And 18 of those have been turned into it. And this was the first pedestrian street that is quiet. You know, and this is what the citizens were doing. It's not because the Scandinavians are so strange. No, it's because in the 70s and 80s, people were going out and people were participating. Maybe in 2012, it's through the internet and through Twitter and other modes. But the citizens can no longer be spectators. The citizens need to participate. And that's how they've been increasing the cycling, is because they get better facilities. And you know, 38 out of 100 trips are done on a bike. So that's some of the things that they're doing in Copenhagen. But even in the middle of the winter, in the snow, over 70% continue, even this little boy. <laughs> Melbourne. Why am I going to tell you about Melbourne? Melbourne is quite interesting because, you know, you go and you see these bridges and people walking all over the place, and it's vibrant and it's exciting. Actually, I thought I was going to bike into Russell Crowe. The reality, I was more hopeful. I thought I was going to bike into Elle McPherson. <laughs> because, you know, she represents a lot of the good things in cycling. It's fun. It's exciting. But I biked into this, this other guy. <laughs> But you also learn from them. They told me, oh, he's a mammal. And I said, what, a mammal? And they said, I said, what, what is a mammal? And then all of a sudden they said, oh, a mammal is the middle-aged man in Lycra. <laughs> <laughs> so you learn from everyone. But I'm going to tell you about Melbourne is, because you know, that's just a myth, people back in all kinds of clothes. But Melbourne, cities do change. Because sometimes people say, oh, people don't change. No, Melbourne, people, cities change. Melbourne, 30 years ago, it was a horrible city. People used to say, you know, it's an empty, useless city center. Everybody was living away. And now, you know, last year was named the most livable city by the economists. And in almost all of the rankings, it's one of the most walkable, one of the most livable. So what did they do? You know, what, what have they done? You know, 30 years ago, it would not have been in the top 300 cities. Now it's in the top five. So, by the way, that is also, that's a blessing, but that also is something bad, which is one of the things that happens in Vancouver. When they tell you that you are so good, people become very reluctant to change. Because they say, oh, we're already one of the best in the world, so why should we change? So it, it's a mixed blessing. But nevertheless, this is some of the things that they did. Planted trees all over the street. Look at some of the streets without trees, and the same street 15 years later with trees. It's totally different. These are the kind of things that how they were changing. Because you got to get cities for people where people want to go to the spice cities, not the spice less. And these laneways were totally spice less. And all of a sudden they turned them into this and they became spice. And then people said, wow, you know, I want to be there. I want to be there not just when I go to work, but maybe I want to be there after work. And I want. So they started building these laneways, these magnificent, not one or two, but dozens and dozens with the city putting seed money and helping and Rob Adams led the process. To, to turn language from this into this. And it was really quite exciting. You know, co and measuring things. How do you measure if people are happy? Well, if people stay in the public places, not if they go by, but if they stay. You know, in 1983, there were two play coffee places with tables outside. You know, and then in 1993, today there's more than 617. So, and this city that was so horrible now is becoming, look, the people that were living there, each that is 500 dwellings. And all of this, so now you get all of this. So this is very interesting. 
But then I want to tell you a little bit about the suburbs. Okay, what do you do with the suburbs? Well, the status quo is not acceptable. So this is some of the things. They have the 7.5% city. They want to go from 2.5 million to 5 million in the same area, in the same built area. So some of the things they say, what is the 7.5%? It's how to densify the activity centers and how to densify the transportation corridors. Everything else stays the same. The other 93%, actually they promote the houses, how to build, plant more trees and so on. So they did the land capacity analysis and then they said, okay, we're not gonna touch any of the parks and we're gonna, not gonna touch any of the heritage buildings or if there's a laneway or if there's something that was developed recently and so on. And then they did the numbers and they realized they could double the population in just uh, involving seven and a half percent. And they also saw that like these buses carry more people than all of those cars. So this is very interesting and at some point we can go into details. But this is what they did and another thing that is very important is to tell people how, how the density. Density is not gigantic buildings horrible, but for example this density is the buildings. Some simple rule of thumb that people can understand. The buildings can not be any taller than the width of the road. So if the width of the road is 40 meters, the building can have 40 meters. If the width of the road is 30, they can go up 30, and so on. And then they started doing the calculations and they started doing the drawings, and then they started realizing that this was viable. And they're in the process. Also showing people what the streets are gonna look like. So these are some of the streets, what they're gonna be look like before and after. And the people say, wow, it might not be that bad. And on top of that, I'm gonna be able to walk to a coffee shop and I'm gonna be able to go to a bookstore and I'm gonna be able to have uh, uh, schools and universities and life and bars and whatever. So it, this is part of the idea when we're gonna densify, we're gonna demystify this density. So this is something that is quite interesting. But let me tell you very different context in social housing in Mexico. I was invited by a developer to provide advice about four years ago when, I, when he, they invited me. You know, I said, is this what social housing is in Mexico? And actually some friends said, don't even don't talk to them. They're like the devil. And I said, yeah, but they're building 50,000 homes. So whether I talk to them or not. And in the last four years, look at some of the things we're doing. Three weeks ago, I was with the 1,700 mayors of Mexico. And then I said, look, this is how people in the wealthy part of Mexico, they live. All of these houses are worth more than a million dollars. And look at these houses, how horrible, you know? People say that one of the indicators of happiness is the, is the social network. There is absolutely no social network. 5 p.m. afternoon, you know, when the kids are in these buildings, you know, these people have more in common with the birds and the planes than with people. So that's when it reminded me. So. They need a revolution. So what are some of the things they're doing? Look at this neighborhood, $20,000 homes, between $20,000 and $45,000 homes, and all of a sudden they're lowering the speed limits and they're doing a lot of changes. You know, four years ago, they had not built one single meter of bikeway. Why? Because they were focused on the house. These houses are 40 square meters. When you live in a 40 square meter house, you barely sleep there. You live it outside. So I said, you know, the sidewalk and the park and the street should be even more important. So now they have built 160 kilometers of bikeways. And I said, if we're promoting so much cycling with your developments, why don't you give out a bicycle once people, uh, for, to anybody as a signing bonus when they buy a house. And then all of this, so now they have given away 102,000 bikes. So it's something that is very interesting. And from the point of view of density, let me show you some of the things, you know. Four years ago, they didn't have, and everything was in one story, single homes. And now, look, now 40% of the 50,000 homes they are doing is three, four, and five stories. And now all of the public places, they got internet, free internet in $20,000 homes, and all of the public spaces have free internet. And then all of a sudden they got these communities, and then because you can have places to buy tacos or drugstores or bakeries or so, if you got this, you know, can you imagine what Jay Jacobs used to say, eyes on the street? This is exactly what's eyes on the street. You know, can you imagine someone coming here at 10 o'clock at night, it's dark, it's rainy? It's totally safe because you got so many eyes on the street. So that is the idea. So, and by the way, in Toronto, the average household house is around 600,000, and we're closing down pools because we don't have money to maintain. Look at all of those public pools in $20,000 homes. So, what is the role of the streets? You know, from the air, any city, the biggest public space are the streets. 
So we got to start thinking, you know, it's our largest public space. So what are we going to do with this? You know, we know how to transport. You know what? Walking, cycling, and transit takes up a lot fewer space than cars. So what are we going to do? You know, are we, build, are we going to build streets for cars or streets for people? Because we can do one or we can do the other. And this has to do with densities. Are, 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 are streets going to look like car storage? Or actually, are they going to contribute to build community? Are we going to have these parking lots that work like a gigantic vacuum that sucks the life out of the city and creates ghosts? Or do we have story, you know, street level activity? So these are some of the things that we got 93 cars park or 20,000 people enjoying and buying in some of these densities. So the street space is our most valuable asset. So how are we going to distribute it? How are we going to use it? Actually, we got to, anybody that walks or bikes or takes transit, we got to give them a present. What is the present? We should lower the speed to 20 miles or less, to 30 kilometers or less everywhere, everywhere. You know why? Because when a car hits you at 30 kilometers an hour, there's only 5% probability that you're going to be killed. So this is something that is absolutely critical. You know, and regarding the built environment, you know, when, We've been building cities for around 5,000 years. But it's been in the last 60 or 70 that we have been building it, thinking more on the car mobility than on people's happiness. And when we define our cities around cars, all we get is more cars. And then we got to invite our friends to help us cross the street. <laughs> and this isn't far from reality. And by the way, when there's an economic success like in Canada, a lot of things improve. Public health, education, entertainment. One thing that does not improve is mobility when it's based on the private car. And it's not just Vancouver, you know, everywhere this is happening around the world, you know, this is Los Angeles. Is this what we want the Canadian cities to actually look like in the future? You know, and many of the emerging economies are doing exactly the same thing. You know, it's... So, you know, I'm building more roads to say, eliminate traffic congestion. It's like if we're gonna put out a fire using gasoline. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> so, but when we define our cities around people, then we're going to get more people, but healthier and happier people, and we're going to get better quality of life. And why is quality of life so important? Because we live in an ever more globalized world. And in an ever more globalized world, the best people, they can live anywhere they want to. Anywhere they want. However you define best. Best people might be the best engineers or the best medical doctors or the best musician or sports organizers or whatever. So quality of life has become the most important tool of economic competitiveness. So, there, you know, we're facing a perfect opportunity in many ways because the stars are aligned, but we got to really think outside the box. And part of thinking outside the box is realizing that there are challenges, but there are opportunities. And we got to build broad alliances between the private sector and the public and the NGO, between the municipality and the provincial government and the federal, between all departments within the city. And then this is not a financial issue. This is not a technical issue. It is a political issue. That's why we need a sense of urgency. We need a political will. We need leadership. We need doers. And we need public engagement. In many ways, we've been working on putting the dogs in a row and the dogs are in a row. You know, and we've been working on doing things right. But what happens if the dogs are walking in the wrong direction? <laughs> you know, such as building roads just for cars. So in addition of doing things right, now we also got to do the right things. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best. <laughs>